Praise God. If you have your Bibles, if you could turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians 6, 10 through 14. If you were here last week, uh, we talked about balance. Um, we did not get into a series at that time, uh, but I think for the next uh, few weeks, uh, we will be in a series and just going to title this The Full Armor of God, and this, of course, would be part one. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 14 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about the full armor of God. This is part one. Let's pray one more time. Dear God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. I thank you, God, that you equip us and you show us and you give us everything that we need to live life and not just survive, but to be overcomers, to be conquerors, to be what you have designed us to be. And I pray, God, that your word would touch our hearts and reveal truth, show us the right contrast, show us the right things that we need to see and help us, Lord, to make a commitment to not just be hearers tonight, but doers as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. How many of you know that uh, members of the military, police force, uh, they wear something called body armor, right? Uh, uh, the different iterations of body armor have changed over the years as uh, technology has improved and things have changed. Um, the first iterations of body armor were uh, helpful, but not super helpful. They would stop a little bit of shrapnel, but uh, not much small arms fire. fire. Uh, even a pistol would shoot through uh, some of the early body armor. And then they moved on to metal plates that you would put in a vest and you'd wear. And um, those were resistant to a lot more, but the problem was uh, a bullet would hit that plate and it would fragment and that metal did not ab absorb any of, the, any of those pieces. Uh, so then you'd have a case where shrapnel could still splinter off and injure uh, the person. And as far as I understand, I, obviously I don't know where the technology is at exactly, uh, but one of the latest iterations is uh, a plate that is uh, ceramic. And the idea behind the ceramic plate uh, is that it not only stops the bullet, but it contains the pieces of metal as well. Uh, so you don't have as much risk of uh, shrapnel hurting you. Uh, I was reading, and it, it's really interesting. There, people in the military will tell you uh, the different armor that's available to them, and it gets to the point where you just there's some armor that they just can't wear because they can't hardly move, right? You you could wear something you could you could wear something that could protect you from just about anything, but uh, at some point it gets very difficult to move. It's very difficult to wear. Uh, one of the people that I was uh, reading up on was saying that it takes a long time to put on this armor, to wear it around, uh, to exercise in it, to run in it, to do all the things that you'd be doing in combat with this armor. 
And you have to do that for a period of time so that you can know how tight you need to have it, how loose you need to have it, so that it's not only functional and protects you, uh, but also allows you to move and allows you to uh, maneuver. I was really shocked to find that most of our soldiers that are overseas uh, fighting in wars, guess how much armor they have and how, how much their gear and their armor weighs. They're, they're carrying around, from what I understand, 70 to 100 pounds of body armor, gear, all these different things. So you can imagine how difficult that is in a climate that is, you know, well over 100 degrees and sunny every single day uh, in the desert. Uh, very difficult, very difficult to do. But uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is the spiritual parallels the understanding that we must wear armor as well. Spiritually speaking, if we're not wearing armor, we're going into a battle with nothing to protect us. It's true that a person who's not wearing any armor can run and move faster than someone who's weighed down by 70 to 100 pounds of, of body armor, but it takes a lot less uh, to remove that soldier from combat. The people... The soldiers that I was reading up on said, you know, yeah, you have the advantage of speed, but it's not going to take much. One, one wound and you're going to be out of the fight. They, you're not going to, it's going to be over. Uh, whereas with body armor, you have a chance not only to live, but to uh, be able to get to safety or perhaps continue to fight in some cases. Um, but the armor of God is not... Uh, fleshly armor. This armor is designed by God for us, knowing that what we need, uh, the way that the Apostle Paul and different writers in the Bible describe this armor was through the lens of what they knew historically, right? Uh, so Paul was borrowing this idea of the armor of the Lord uh, from other scriptures. Actually, you know, you're talking about what the Bible that he had was what? It was the Old Testament, right? So the Apostle Paul was looking to the Old Testament and also to uh, perhaps some to the armor of the day that, uh, that soldiers wore. Uh, but the, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 11, 4 and 5, uh, he said this, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Verse 5, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reign. So it's talking about the same kind of things being uh, girded up for battle, different things that, uh, that are spiritual in nature, but uh, can be described in a way that we would understand physically. Uh, Isaiah 49 and 2 says, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a, a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. This is talking about weapons, right? This is talking about God making us and teaching us how to use the tools that he's given us, uh, not only to defend ourselves, uh, but to advance forward in a world that is uh, full of spiritual wickedness. Isaiah 52 and 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It's talking about the same kind of things, the, the parts of the armor that we're going to talk about in this series, uh, all the way back in Isaiah. Isaiah 59 and 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So this, when you talk about the full armor of God, it's not an armor that was designed by humanity. It wasn't designed by people. As a matter of fact, uh, God speaking to and through his prophets is describing these concepts that this, this is what your armor is going to be like, uh, giving us an understanding that we might be able to uh, make out something that is uh, familiar to what our eyes can see, but 
the phrase be strong, right? Be strong in the Lord. That's actually an echo of Jehovah's words to Joshua as he was sent uh, to continue the mission of Moses and lead Israel into the promised land. Joshua 1 and 6 says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And again, the phrase be strong is used as Zechariah's words regarding God's promise to make those who return from Babylonian exile strong in the Lord. Zechariah 10 and 12 says, And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. So what Paul was preaching to his congregation, to the people at the time, was something that he was drawing from the prophets, armor and uh, different weapons and tools that God had given uh, throughout the Old Testament and continuing into the Old Testament because the Apostle Paul began to understand that these spiritual protections were for the spiritual warfare that the early church was very much a part of, something they were very, very familiar with. Um, You could say that the Apostle Paul's congregation was at uh, different points where it it was do or die. I mean, it it really was. If we think that we're persecuted today, we are not. Compared to them, we are not. Uh, It's not really close at all. But what Paul was telling his congregation was, if we face death, who knows what today holds? But what we've got to learn, what he was telling his people was, we've got to learn how to be strong in the Lord, not in our own abilities. Because throughout history and continuing today, we try and do stuff ourselves, right? We think, well, I can handle that. I can do that. I, 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 can, I can figure this out. And then we, we come to the Lord and we find out that it's, it's harder than we realized it would be. And we thought, hey, this, this was either supposed to be easier, or it was supposed to be something that I was supposed to be able to do, but we would do well to listen to the Apostle Paul that it's not in our strength. It's not in our abilities. And learning to be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might, that can take time. That, that's not something that, that oh, I, I came into church and, and now I understand it fully and I, I, I can do it very easily because we're not used to surrender, right? We don't want anybody else telling us how to live our lives, right? That, that's contrary to our culture. That's contrary to our nature. And many times we find ourselves in a situation where we say, God, if you just let me take care of this, I could handle this. I could, I could take care of this for you. But the answer is not in our strength and not in our ability. You see, in Bible times, there were, the war was set out in different ways, right? You had some soldiers who were maybe on the walls of the city, and they have a bow and arrow or something. They, they'd be the archers. And then you'd have other soldiers that were riding on horses or in chariots or whatever it might be. Uh, there were different types of soldiers. But what it's talking about here is foot soldiers. When it talks about us as Christians, we should view ourselves as a foot soldier. And the armor is designed specifically to protect uh, a foot soldier. I could uh, probably try and make some connections with um, uh, the different riders and the different warriors and the different uh, types of soldiers that they had. Uh, But really what this is telling us, when you put on this armor, when you understand that you're in a spiritual battle, we need to realize that it's not about doing things that we used to do. It's not about doing things the way the flesh would want to do it, the way we used to do it in our own abilities. Because Ephesians 4.24 says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's not just about taking armor, spiritual armor, and applying it to our old flesh. It's about being born again, right? That's how we enter the kingdom. And everything is new in the kingdom, and old things are passed away, and We rejoice over all these things. And we also need to learn that in order to survive in a spiritual environment, 
with this new life that we have, it's going to take spiritual armor. And we've got to understand what it is and apply it in our lives. So it's interesting to me that we are foot soldiers, not horsemen or some other type of soldier. And it reminds me of uh, the prophet Jeremiah, what the Lord said in Jeremiah 12 and 5. It says this, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? What he was saying was, listen, Jeremiah, you're, you have issues, you have legitimate things that are happening in your life right now, but what the Lord is telling him is, you've got to learn to trust in my strength, and you've got to learn to wear the armor that I provided for you, because if you don't do that, the next thing that's coming is going to wipe you out. The next thing that's coming, you're not going to be able to withstand. And that's why when you read, especially the first part of the book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah chapter 12, he faced some intense battles. Throughout his life, there was different times he was, uh, most of the time, his own people wouldn't listen to him. They mocked him. Uh, they threw him in pits. They threw him in prison. Uh, they left him for dead. There was all sorts of things that he had to go through, and it wasn't just a physical thing. It was because he had a word from the Lord, and they didn't want to hear it. There was a spiritual battle that was happening, and he was doing the right thing. He was delivering the message, but the message was not being heard, and he was suffering dearly because of that. Now, thankfully, he was a man of understanding, and he kept at it, and uh, he made it to the, to the stronger levels, where when he started, it was just, oh, my brothers, my family, uh, the church, as it were, they don't seem to like me, they don't seem to listen to me. Well, that was tough in itself at first, but he had to learn strength from that. He had to learn how to wear the armor through that because one day he was going to be in those pits and he was going to be in prison. And I think if it's good for the prophet Jeremiah, and if it's something that he had to learn and understand that we should expect nothing different for ourselves. I was reading some commentary on this subject. Um, this, is, this, is not <laughs> this is not some random commentary I read different things, and I, some things I really take with a grain of salt, other things I trust more fully, but this is, this is from the Apostolic Study Bible. So this is from uh, men and women who are Holy Ghost-filled, uh, oneness, apostolic Pentecostals. I feel like they're credible and trustworthy sources. And one of the things they said is that, unfortunately, many modern-day Christians have become spiritually dull, and they've been lulled into a false sense of security. And what happens as a result, this creates in us a lethargic response to evil. So much so that a lot of times we don't even recognize evil when it's happening anymore. Because we've been lulled to sleep by uh, you know, life is good and we're not persecuted and all these things and here's this verse and that verse and that's what I like, so I'll, I'll just hang on to that. And we get lethargic. And a lot of times, Christians today, we read Ephesians 6, 12 and these verses about putting on this armor and it sounds, it sounds primitive, right? It sounds like, oh, well, that was, that was something for armies of the past, and technology has changed so much, and that was just for the early church. And you start talking about principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, and people say, what? What, what are you talking about? What? 
Or we say, well, yeah, that's, that's out there. That's out in the world. That's, that's somewhere else. We don't need to worry about that. One of the preachers that I uh, follow said this, most people wouldn't want Paul as your pastor. He had no hesitation about noting the influences of Satan in people's lives and the unlikelihood of repentance of some people in the church and calling out sin and naming names. He says, gentle does not mean what you think it means. And I was struck by that because you know, we, don't, we don't hear that kind of talk, right? We, we don't look at it that way. We, we tend to take all the, uh, the negative things and we say, well, that, that's the world. That's describing the world. But the Apostle Paul, a lot of times he was saying this, he was facing directly at the church. And he was saying to the church, you that will listen, be careful. Understand, pay attention, put on the armor, know what's happening around you. When he said, perilous times shall come, the word peril, the word for violent and dangerous, it comes from within. Paul was looking at the church. And it was internal disobedience in the church that made it perilous times. And so he was saying, this is the armor that you need to wear. This is how you prevent yourself from being dull and ignorant. Ephesians chapter 3 tells us that we're not only supposed to recognize spiritual wickedness around us, but we're supposed to, a natural thing that will happen is that wickedness will be confronted with God's wisdom through his church. It's a natural fact that that's how it works. Because Ephesians 3.10 says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And Ephesians 5.13 says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. I'm here to tell you tonight that God's true church and true righteousness through his church exposes evil for what it is. And it does that not in our abilities, not in our knowledge, but it does it through God's righteousness and wisdom. It's a natural thing. It just happens. That's how the church works. That's how he works through the church to bring light to a dark world. So in the face of intense spiritual battle, when we choose to be ignorant and indifferent, to the evil that's trying to destroy us. Guess what happens? The evil then becomes more powerful and it becomes even harder to distinguish. You see, in Paul's day, evil powers operating behind the scenes spoke to experiences that were more real to the early church than the stones and the blood and the flesh around them. If you want to talk about the supernatural, the early church knew it. They understood it very well. The material world was not something that totally captivated them, but the spiritual world, the things they saw, the things they experienced in warfare, the, the miracles they saw, it's all part of seeing and understanding the spiritual world around them. And so the Apostle Paul was, of course, giving the divinely inspired word of God here, and he was 
understanding that this armor was necessary because of the enemy's nature. He understood we're not dealing with mortals. He had an understanding that our enemies are spawned somewhere else. They're spawned in lofty heights of another atmosphere and specifically prepared to wreak spiritual destruction on my life and on your life. The Apostle Paul in the early church knew that it was no joke. They knew every single day that Satan was coming for them. Were they afraid? No, I don't believe they were afraid. But they were aware. And they understood. And we need to be as well. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, our cause is to engage spiritual enemies on a very deeply personal level. It's interesting in Ephesians 6, when it's talking about this armor, it uses a verb here that it's not battle, but it's wrestle. When you think of wrestling, you're talking hand-to-hand combat, right? You're talking up close and personal. I'm, I'm talking about every single day. I'm talking about things that I can't afford to wait until Sunday to pray about it. I can't afford to wait until Wednesday to pray about it. I, I, I can't afford to text a friend and wait till they get back to me with advice. That's too long. I've got to put on the armor every single day. I've got to be ready every single day. I've got to be in the Word every single day. Because this is close contact. This is very strenuous warfare. And I'm not saying every, every day is going to be miserable and horrible. Again, God gives us victory. He fights the battle for us. When we obey and we put on his armor like he tells us to and we live the way he wants us to live, that's where we experience victory. And not all days are created equal. Some days are horrible and difficult. And other days are sunny and great. But you see these demonic spirits that Paul was talking about he had a greater understanding, I think, because he realized that the spirits that were oppressing the church were the spirits that were being worshipped by the world around them, right? Paul knew this completely. He knew their idols. He knew the names of their idols. He saw what they did. He understood about the different gods that they worshipped, even from the ancient world. And what he's saying to the church is, Yes, maybe we have a history with that. Maybe before we were saved, we were doing the same things. But we've been translated out of that. We've been transitioned out of that. We're no longer under the jurisdiction of those spirits. When you receive the Holy Ghost, when you're baptized in Jesus' name, it's a new life. It's a new person. Those things don't have that power over you. But it does not mean, just because we've been removed from their lordship in our lives, it does not mean that we're pulled out of the situation and now we don't have to deal with it anymore. As a matter of fact, all it means is we're just being turned around and saying, now go fight against what used to control you. Now go fight against the things that used to have you as their prisoner. Go to battle against these dark powers. Being a Christian means conflict is necessary. It is required for the simple fact that the enemy hates your resistance. He wants to tame it, he wants to quiet it, and eventually he wants to kill it. I heard a preacher say one time that the devil doesn't care so much about killing you physically, he just wants to take the fight out of you. He just wants to make you seek a life of ease. He, he wants you to be comfortable, he wants you to be numb, he, he wants you to believe that uh, spiritual warfare is a thing of the past or it's only for the pastor or it's only for this person or that person or this, this armor thing isn't for you anymore. If, that's, if he can get us there, I don't believe he has a problem letting us come to church on Sunday and Wednesday. As long as we don't believe that there's a real battle going on, I,
I think we, we underestimate or we just don't understand sometimes his tactics. And so the Word and the Spirit of God are designed to help us. Verse 614 of Ephesians says, tells us about the first specific piece of armor, and that is truth. And this is appropriate because the enemy does not employ brute force against you. The, the enemy doesn't come against you spiritually and, and, and literally chain you up in your house somewhere. Um, can people have experiences like this? Absolutely. It can happen that way. But more often than not, the devil works subtly to get at us. He hides his fatal weapons under a clean, nice-looking cloak. And this is how he makes evil appear good. And if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention, if we're not walking in the Spirit, we're going to look at it and say, that's good. It looks good. Everything looks good. Satan lies to us constantly. And his lies usually come to us first with that light bulb moment. Is, oh, wow. I never heard that before. That sounds really good. That sounds right. It sounds like profound wisdom. But the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 4.1 and 1 John 4.1 that his attacks often come through beguiling heresy. That's how he does it. The trick is to confuse us. The trick is to catch us outside of the Word of God or catch us at a point where we don't filter what we think is unchallengeable truth or or deep, profound wisdom that we just heard on the radio or somewhere. I don't know about you, but I've had these, these things have happened to me. I've heard stuff, and I thought, that is awesome. What a revelation. That is so cool. And a few days later, you're praying, and you think, you know, wait a minute. Something about that isn't quite right. And you start reading your Bible, and you realize, wow, that sounded really good but it's actually contrary to what the Word of God says. That's, that's happened to me before. Maybe it's happened to you too, and if it hasn't, be prepared. This is why the Apostle Paul gave such specific instructions on how things were to be done in the church, even including spiritual gifts, even including down to the number of times that a certain gift was used in a certain way. This is serious stuff. So the girdle or the belt is what enabled the warrior to fight furiously without hindrance. Isaiah metaphorically envisioned Jehovah as wearing such a belt when he avenged his people in Isaiah 11, 4, and 5. And the same is true of the breastplate imagery, except that it is derived from Isaiah 59 and 17. To put on the breastplate of righteousness is to put on God's own righteousness, a righteousness that informs my ethics and helps me to understand that it's not what I think, it's not my opinion in this situation, but what does God say? What does the word say? What is the real right thing to do here? What is the real right thing to say here? And that righteousness enables us to become followers, or perhaps a better translation of that word, imitators of God, that you read about in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Praise God. I'm not going to take more time uh, tonight. I know last time I went a little bit over, and I apologize for that, but it is 8 o'clock, so I'm going to close. If you would stand with me.
to recap what we're talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, the first thing that we need to do is not the first piece of armor that we need to put on. The first thing that we need to do is to pray and surrender to God and learn to be strong in him and in the power of his might and not our own abilities. That's what we learn before we put on one piece of armor. And we should do this every single day. I was, I was reading some commentary. Um, it never ceases to amaze me. I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for the truth. I'm, I'm thankful for the whole gospel. And there are people, there are denominations out there that don't have the same revelation, perhaps not near the same. But they understand, they teach their people, you have to pray every day. You have to get up and pray. You have to read the Bible. It's not negotiable. And I pray that those come to full revelation and all those things, but understand the Word of God, there's so many things, there's, there's such good that can be revealed. And just because we have Acts 2.38 and oneness doctrine, there's, there's much more that we need to understand. So first we pray and surrender to God. We learn how to be strong in Him and the power of His might. Next thing we do, we begin to put on the whole armor. We don't neglect a certain part. We don't say, today I just want the sword. No, we put on the whole armor, and it begins with the belt of truth. If truth isn't, truth is what ties everything together. If we don't have truth, uh, we're going to suffer. And then the second thing uh, tonight was to cover your core, your vital organs, uh, spiritually speaking, with God's righteousness. I was talking in the beginning about uh, soldiers and the body armor that they wear. Wearing some kind of chest plate reduces mortality rate by 1,400%. That's a lot. It's worth wearing your armor. It's worth putting on. And so, Lord willing, uh, we're going to talk more about armor, uh, some more of the armor next week. Um, looking forward to that. But as the other classes wind down, I want to pray one more time. I want to encourage you, pray this every day. Pray Ephesians chapter 6 every single day. Pray it over your children. Pray it over your house. Understand that uh, there's an evil that wants to destroy you every single day. And we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Dear God, thank you for the church. Thank you for your people. Most of all, God, I thank you for your word. Lord, when I can't find truth anywhere else, when nothing else seems to make sense, your word is truth. Your word is forever settled in heaven. What you tell us in your word will work for us today. It's not just a story. It's not just a history book. But God, I pray that you would help me to be awake and aware and understand that there's a spiritual battle that's going on for my soul, for the souls of my children, for the souls of the people that I reach out to, for my neighbors, for anyone that you teach a Bible study to. Help us to understand the people that come to church with us on Sunday and Wednesday. Oh God, help us. Make us aware that there's a battle going on. Make us wise, Lord. Don't let us be lazy and ignorant, but help us to understand the devil's devices and help us to put on this armor every single day and walk in your spirit so that we can see victory and so that we can be the overcomers that you designed us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.